Hello, my name is James Trost, and this is A2 Insight. Today's guest is Angela Kuyava, the Managing Director of the Desai Accelerator at the University of Michigan. Yes. Angela, welcome to A2 Insight. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, we're very glad to have you here. And as I like to start off all of our shows, we want to learn a little bit more about you. So could you start out by telling us more about where you grew up, your early influences, and let's get you to the end of your academic studies. So sure. please begin. I grew up in Bridgeport, Michigan, which is, uh, I guess you could call it a suburb of Saginaw. And so I grew up kind of on the, what I would call the farm side of Bridgeport. Bridgeport is really almost at the intersection if you think of Saginaw as a city. Um, it's kind of where the city and the country meet. And that during, throughout my school, my middle school and high school, actually caused some cultural issues among the uh, students and the greater community. And so as I was growing up, um, there, there were issues with violence, there were issues with a lot of partisan, um, ish, uh, partisan taking sides on, on certain things. And so I felt like there was, there was always conflict. Um, and I think that really did shape a lot of how I approached um, leaving Bridgeport. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting statement. Let's just yeah. delve a little bit further into when you talk about issues and, and partisan within that. We're growing up in Bridgeport, which is kind of on the edge of the suburb of Saginaw and the rural area of Saginaw. Mm -hmm. What were the, where was this antagonism? Where was this, what was going on within those communities that was so frustrating? For you? Sure, there were, um, there were issues related to race. There were issues related to class. Mm -hmm. There were students coming in from migrant families. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, you know, kids from, from farms, you know, kids who drove tractors to school. And if you remember, so this was back in the um, 80s and early 90s, um, we, were, we were at a time when all of these things were starting to boil over and come to a head, you know, even, even on the coasts you saw those things happening. And um, we didn't escape it. And if you think about Saginaw, if you think about Saginaw, Flint, Detroit, um, those were auto towns and really affected, impacted in the 80s when, of course, that industry be, suffered uh, quite tremendously. And so I actually come from a blue collar family. My father worked in a factory for an automotive supplier for over 40 years. My grandfather worked for General Motors. Um, my grandmother worked uh, also in a factory. Actually, both of my grandmothers worked. There was no question as to whether or not I would work. Um, and, and it wasn't even a a thought you know I just all of my family has, has always worked and um, so you have this community that financially was impacted hard by what was going on in the auto industry and then just culturally a lot of things going on and it, it led to trouble even even within the schools now I don't want to paint Bridgeport as an unsafe area mm -hmm. or but but there was conflict and mm -hmm. so that that actually did impact um, how how I approached things, how I reacted to things. Um, and then when I when I came here to Ann Arbor, I applied to the University of Michigan. It was the only school I applied to. It was the one I wanted to go to. I do not recommend that to any other student. Um, and I was an excellent student, uh, top of my class in high mm -hmm. school. Um, and I, I I loved school. I, I loved being a student, but I got here and the world was sure. very different, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a very diverse campus, it's a diverse town. It is, you know, you can find a student from almost any country on the planet here. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was a, a peacefulness that I had not experienced before, but I was also very lost sure. here. Well, well, and we're gonna get you here, but yeah. I, I, I'm still kind of interested in just the idea of how for most of us, when we go through high school, and you know, we we're not really uh, it, again. Maybe it depends on where you go, obviously. But how that, uh, that for a 16-year-old girl seeing the struggles and the challenges of the world in which she's living, most folks are kind of oblivious or protectively don't even want to don't get it. 
for some reason you felt this as a teenager, just the struggles and the strife between the different groups within the area. Yeah. I'm just interested because that will affect you when you get to Ann Arbor, but mm -hmm. how, did that, uh, how did it manifest itself just in terms of your high school experience? Did you see these conflicts within groups within the high school experience? Yeah, or? absolutely. So I, I tell this story often. Um, for whatever reason, my school bus every year on the first day of school was late. I don't know why, it was a long route, whatever. Um, so when I walked in, very first day of high school, freshman year, walking in late, um, I had on a dress, like a little denim dress, so, so, you know, small town, and two girls were fighting, like fist fighting, and I felt something hit me, and I looked down, and one, one of the young women had pulled out the other one's braid, and it was on my feet. Mm -hmm. Right, so I walk into high school, and the first thing I experience is violence. Um, now, that there was kind of a sea change over the course of my four years there, and to to the credit of the faculty and staff at Bridgeport, they actually addressed this head on. So when you said how how was I aware? Well, first of all, I experienced it firsthand, but. Um, there was also a lot of effort put into addressing what was going on and, and there was um, one lunch hour where there was visible polarization among groups of students and the principal of our high school stopped all classes that day, brought everyone, every single student to the gym and said we need to talk about this and allowed students to get up on the microphone and talk about the problems that were going on in the school. Um, and, and I mean, that was really a wonderful way to say, hey, we care about what's going on. We want to hear your opinion. Um, but it was, it, it's also, you know, it's nerve wracking in a way to, to have to confront these issues. And I think by the time I graduated, certainly things weren't perfect, but a lot of work was being done in order to bring everybody together. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Well, then we get to Ann Arbor, which is a different world, as you've already <laughs> different described. Different world. And so, I mean, perhaps this could be your reason, or maybe give you another, but the uh, interactions of groups and individuals and how humans interact might be an area of interest to you as you pursue the study of anthropology. Absolutely. Why did you study anthropology as a major? Um, I wish I had a really good answer for this, and I don't. Um, I, it was suggested to me to take this uh, entry-level biological anthropology class. A lot of students in my dorm really loved it, and I wasn't, I wasn't what I would call a hard science type person, and, and um, you know, they said, oh, this is a really good entry-level class for you. I took it, it was with um, Professor, uh, Dr. Roberto Frisancho, who was funny and engaging and wonderful and, and so brilliant. Um, and I ended up just loving everything that I, that I studied. You know, if you think about anthropology, it is the, the origin story of everything, right? It's the origin story of people. I studied, I concentrated primarily in human evolution, um, but it's the origin story of biology. It's the origin story of what we eat and how we communicate. And I love I loved that, and I loved getting down to the bottom of why why are we doing the things that we do, and and so why did I major in it? Uh, I spoke to an academic advisor. Oh gosh, the university is probably gonna not love me saying this, but I spoke to an academic advisor who said, major in something you love be here to learn and be here to study. You're going to get some dot-com job. It's going to pay you $80,000 a year out of school. You'll be fine. Um, I went to school. I started in 1996, so this is during the dot-com boom. Well, I graduated in 2000, and the bubble had burst. <laughs> and so I did not get a, an $80,000 a year dot-com job. But I did, you know, I did follow their advice and take the opportunity to study something I enjoyed learning about. Um, so in addition to anthropology, you know, the, a lot of it, to, again, it's, it's the story of things. I also took a lot of creative writing classes, telling stories, and a lot of history. So, so I think that storytelling has always been in my blood. And just understanding, understanding people and why, what might compel them to do the things they do. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So we graduate, 
And the $80,000.com job may not necessarily be materializing with your VA from Michigan. What happens next? I um, <coughs> took a job at a shared office space company. It was, it was really sort of a, an administrative assistant type position. Um, ended up staying there less than a year, but I was kind of sending my resume and still date me a little bit to anybody that had a fax machine. Um, and was put in contact with um, a financial planning firm. And the owner was, you know, we met, I had an interview. Um, he was an alum of the university, liked to give uh, chances to university alumni, and, and really offered me a career path. And again, kind of going back to my upbringing and that blue collar, you know, it's, it's get a job, go somewhere where you have job security and you get a paycheck so that you can pay your bills. And I saw a career path. It didn't even matter to me what the, the subject matter was that I was working with. It felt safe and it felt secure. And so I started doing that and I became a certified financial planner. I became a certified investment management analyst. Learned a lot about personal finance. What I loved most, as you might now imagine about me, um, I loved working with clients. I loved helping them plan helping them plan what their future might look like, you know, where their children are going to school and, and how they can afford to do that, what they might do in retirement. I had one client who said, I want to retire and all I want to be able to do is take one trip a year. How do we get me there? And so the retirement planning piece, I really loved. The finance part of it, the, the hard numbers, I was much less interested in, but that's kind of part and parcel with what you do. And then what comes after your experience in financial planning? Uh, so, well, 2008 happened, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we watched as the world changed dramatically and the Great Recession started, um, and kind of professionally and personally, my life really fell apart. Um, and I like to say the universe afforded me an opportunity to, to find out what I really loved to do. Um, in the interim, you know, the job market was really tight. Uh, I had serendipitously um, was able to take a position as the interim executive director of 826 Michigan, which is mm -hmm. a local nonprofit dedicated to um, helping students uh, with one-on-one -on -one attention to classwork and reading and writing. I was president of the board of directors at the time, and our executive director was going on a four-month maternity leave, and so I was able to step in and, and fill in for her in that role. And it, I learned that I didn't want to work in nonprofits. I felt very strongly that I couldn't, um, it didn't allow me the third thing in life. So, so you have your home life, you have your work life, and then the, the opportunity for giving and the opportunity for giving of your time and your money. And when you work at a nonprofit, you can't even imagine giving any of that energy to anything but yours, right? And, and so I much preferred to be on the um, board of director side or committee side, um, but what it did teach me how to do was a lot with almost nothing. Mm. So nonprofits, especially smaller nonprofits, are very entrepreneurial in that manner. So I had to learn how to do fundraising. I had to learn how to do marketing. And, and not a ton, right? It was only four months that I did this. But while I was there, I helped put on a 700-person event, uh, among many other events. I had to call and ask for money, which is not a thing that I'd had to do before. And it was, it was sort of a very intense boot camp on on how to do something with nothing. Um, during that time, I sort of fell back on what do, what do I really like to do and what might I want to do? And it seemed to me that marketing might be something that I wanted to go into. A complete left turn from what I'd been doing, but again, I'd been given this clean slate. Um, and I, a friend at the Chamber of Commerce, the Ann Arbor Chamber of Commerce, had received a phone call from the president of Logic Solutions, which is a local software company here in town. And he was looking for a marketing director and she said, I, I want you to call and I want you to ask for an interview. I said, Lindsay, I don't 
nothing on my resume indicates that I would be any good at this job. They're not even, they're, they're, why would they even talk to me? And she, she really pushed me to do it. Everybody should have a friend like this to push you to do something outside of your comfort zone. And I did, and I like to joke that they gave me a pity interview. Um, but uh, it, as it turned out, they were, again, willing to take a shot on somebody who wasn't proven. And I was actually there for seven years. Mm. I transitioned from a role in marketing. I did some product management and then ultimately um, reabsorbed the marketing organization and um, UIUX creative directing. I was their director of innovation. Mm. So. Again, no, this was a small company, right? Very entrepreneurial minded, and a lot of the clients were entrepreneurs as well. So just a lot of um, down in the dirt, how are we going to get things done? I did have to learn a lot about technology, which I knew very little about coming into it, um, and, and did become really passionate about that. And so that's, that's where I was before the university. How do we get to the Desai Accelerator at the University of Michigan? I was ready for my next challenge after seven years where I was, but again, I was sort of in this place where I didn't know what was next. I started working with a coach. Um, my my uh, my husband's friend's wife was is a coach and. Um, started some exercises with me and she really had to take me down to the foundations. She said, I want you to make a list of things you like. And I said, Tina, I, don't, I told you, I don't know what job I might want to do next. And she said, no, no, the color blue, your cat. You know, she just, she took me to the bare minimum so that I could build back up and say, okay, here's, here's what I want to be doing. Um, and I decided on two potential career paths. Um, or I guess I was already in a career, but two potential um, next steps in my career. One would be to go back to school and um, at the School of Information and with a concentration on human computer interaction. I really loved like user experience, user interface design. The other was consulting with small businesses. Well, if you remember, I didn't get my MBA out of school. I got a CFP, a SEMA, um, which are respectable and, and long programs, but they don't have the, um, you know, sort of cachet of an MBA on your resume. And so I honestly thought that there was no way that I would be, be, be considered for these jobs. <laughs> it's kind of a theme. Um, but again, I had a friend. It's all about connections, right? It's all about the this people who... This is important for yes. people to know. Yes. Um, so I had a friend at the university at the Zellery Institute, and I mentioned to her that I was looking for my next move. And she said, well, this job at the Desai Accelerator just opened up. I think you should apply. Okay. And again, I said, I don't know why they would consider me for this. But as it turns out, it was a good fit. And so I started there in 2017. And I think really the the background that I had in investing, even though it was personal investing, I, I still had the, the bones there to understand what was going on, plus my background in innovation and technology really married well with what you do as you consult startups. Well, and that is interesting. I mean, I, I, I like the diversity of things that you've done, but it's interesting because we're going to get into the whole concept of being an entrepreneur, which given your initial description of your life is really... You're, you come from a background that believes in the importance of structure mm -hmm. and, and, and making sure you pay your bills and you get your <laughs> things planned. Then you go into retirement and deal with financial planning. The world of being an entrepreneur isn't necessarily uh, structured in such a way that you have any guarantee. So I'm interested in how we move from here. What exactly, let's start with finance. What is the Desai Accelerator? Why don't we start there? So the Desai Accelerator is an organization that helps startups make rapid growth. Um, and we help early stage tech-enabled startups. An accelerator is different from an incubator in that we are time bound. So companies spend, historically, it's been anywhere from three to four months. We can talk about we're moving to a 10-month program this year. We provide them with resources such as investment in their companies. 
office space, mentorship. We work with more than 150 mentors, many of whom are alumni from the University of Michigan, and programming or curriculum. So they, they come into the accelerator. We have a, a very specific focus on how to take these companies that are very focused on their product and help them build a scalable, sustainable business out of what they're doing. One of the really unique elements of the Desai Accelerator um, among you know, the, the ecosystem of accelerators has to do with our relationship with the university. We recruit, hire, manage, and pay, which is key, 10 interns from the university. We recruit from all schools and colleges, and they are in a cohort simultaneous to the startups. What that allows us to do is have the startups submit projects to us. Could be anything from market research to a social media campaign, a video, we did a video submission to Shark Tank, designing a mobile application, designing a back-end application. It really runs the gamut of skill sets and we put together cross-functional teams in order to execute these projects. During our last program, our interns completed 70 projects for the companies that were, yeah. These are paid internships, I assume. Paid right? internships, yeah. Well, let's start, let's start at the beginning then, because yeah. I, I think it's interesting, and uh, for those who don't understand, the, the, you're, uh, we have, we've had people on the show, we've had uh, the uh, president of Tech Town at, at Wayne State, and mm -hmm. at Stapler here, we've had uh, a woman who runs the Center for Entrepreneurship at Washington Community College, the, the, you know, the, 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 this is a different focus. This is really more somebody looking for an idea and looking for funding to get it going as opposed to the idea, right? In, in well, that they come in, they, they already have to have the business formed, and they okay. have to have at least a prototype of what they're doing. Okay. Um, so we're a little bit past the idea stage, but not much okay. past the idea. <laughs> well, and then that's the question, you because you, this is this always interests me. I mean, I we've got service uh, entrepreneurs, people starting stores and restaurants. How do you define, I guess would be that, you said that this is for tech startups. How do you define what is a tech product? For instance. So we say tech enabled, which is, is really wide, but we take a look at a number of different areas of risk when we're assessing companies. So we want to make sure that if they're not already in the market, they can be in the market within a year, which does then exclude a lot of things like medical devices that take many years. We need to make sure that the resources we provide actually help move the needle for the companies. So if if an organization needs $10 million before they can even get to market, that's not a great fit for what we do. But something like a software company um, or a software product company, you know, twenty-five dollars to $50,000 can get them several months of operations, of growth under their belt. So those tend to be a good fit. We want to make sure that the mentorship and the programming we have aligns with what they're doing. So something like um, a food and beverage company. You know, we're, we're talking about fundraising. We're talking about business model canvas. We are talking about um, rapid growth, rapid revenue. That might not be a great fit. Um, but we, we do have a lot of tech and tech-enabled companies that can move very quickly, that do not have extreme capital needs, and that we have mentors who have been there, done that, and understand their industries, and those are good fits for our accelerator. Well, I, having been an entrepreneur, I would love to have had the resources instead of a hit and miss that most of us, because it's not, taking a risk as an entrepreneur is usually a different breed of individuals. Absolutely. But I'm interested too, that at the Desai Accelerator, what is the funding mechanism for this organization? The, who is Desai? Where, what is that? What is the mission of the? How, I mean, how do you end it up at the University of Michigan? You're not a student at the university. You could be any old business that contacts you. Is that correct? Yes. Well, uh, until this cohort. So the first five cohorts that we ran, we would accept applications from any tech-enabled startup. And specifically, you actually couldn't be a student. We want folks who are working full-time on their businesses. So this um, stemmed from an idea back in 2013 when there were not a lot of accelerators in the landscape. Now a lot came up as Desai um, was organizing. But at the time, there really weren't. And um, so we, our benefactors are the Desai Sethi Family Foundation. Okay. Bharat Desai and Nirja Sethi started Sintel in Troy, which is an IT outsourcing company. They actually were, uh, Sintel was acquired in 2018. 
and um, the Desai Foundation wanted to give back to the Southeast Michigan community in a really meaningful way, and and um, we had additional funding from the William Davidson Foundation, which is a local foundation here. And so what the groups came up with together was an accelerator that would help this tech industry here in Ann Arbor and in the surrounding region um, and help individuals at the university who were encouraged by all the programs that we offer to start ventures, but then sort of lose that support as they graduate or feel that they lose that support as they graduate. And so we created a post-graduation program to serve several needs. Now, we've had uh, people on this program too, including the commercial real estate, Jim Jaconis, who, who talks about what kind of businesses come into Ann Arbor. Is there any connection between these companies starting and the hope that they would be locating locally? Or do you, I mean, is this, is it, if I have a product that's launching, are you, in addition to helping with these aspects, trying to find them office space here locally? Or do these, are these national companies, where, where do most of your uh, people come from that would, would want to go through the process? So I think my answer is twofold. Um, one, we want these businesses to be successful. Mm -hmm. And if that means they have to be located elsewhere, then that's fine. You know, we, we take an investment stake in their company and we want them to do what's best for their company. Would we love it if they established themselves here? Absolutely. And so we, we do partner with a number of local organizations mm -hmm. to provide resources to them in the hopes that we can create an environment that is conducive to building their business here. Well, and that would be for what local organizations would you be connecting with that we would want to, because Ann Arbor, we, we you know, the, the communities either grow or they don't. Right. And we have challenges, certainly parking and other stuff, but it seems to me the connection between anything that could bring in more jobs for the area, new products, excitement, what organizations do you partner with then and that hope to keep them here and not go to the LA or San Francisco or Silicon Valley? Yeah. We work very closely with Ann Arbor Spark. Um, and in fact, we've, we've partnered on a number of different programs even beyond the accelerator. So uh, we started a CEO masterclass that we ran in partnership with Spark and Ted Deco from Arbor, Dakota. Um, we work closely with the area co-working spaces. So you have the startup garage that's located with Menlo, Cahoots. Um, as, as companies exit the accelerator, they need places to go. Um, and environments, you know, they're used to that cohort setting. And so co-working spaces often provide, from a financial standpoint and from a cultural standpoint, an experience that is really conducive to startups. We have the Michigan Venture Capital Association here in um, the Southeast Michigan region that offers a number of different programs both for us and for startups and, and can help connect them to angel groups here and venture capital groups here. So it sounds, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to picture this, I want you to walk me through a successful ex example of some of an organization. The idea that if I'm as an entrepreneur, I've got, an, um, I've got a product, let's say some software program, let's use mm -hmm. that as an example. And I'm going into your place, and it's almost sounds like a one-shop stop. I mean, you're going to help with everything in terms of I, I, I'm more fascinated by just the idea of 10, 10 mentoring individuals coming from different departments at the university. I mean, I don't know what you, who you're going to get out of the English department, but perhaps that's possible. How do you connect? Now, I guess maybe that would be, a, let's take someone who's come in there, that's gone through your mentoring process, that's gone through the investment, and a whole look through this process, when you first got there and where they are today. So do you have any examples of how the process would work? If I come in as an entrepreneur and I'm getting through the various hoops, what will I experience? Yes. So, and I just want to clarify, the, the 10 individuals that I spoke of before are interns. So they might be um, art students who can do graphic design. They might be business students who can do financial pro forma, marketing. So that's the education. It's the, those, those mentors are students. No, nope, those are just interns. Okay. Our mentors, on the other hand, um, are a very diverse group. They could be um, industry experts. So mm -hmm. someone like Eugene Lee, who is head of strategy and operations at Pinterest. He's a University of Michigan alum. Mm -hmm. When we had a a company, Me Padrino, who is building an online um, event planning marketplace. Someone like Eugene, who has all of this Pinterest experience, was enormous for them, right? Can, can provide sure. guidance in that way. 
we have serial en entrepreneurs, someone mm -hmm. like Satish Malnick, who is the CEO of Next Services, among other companies. He has built high growth, scalable businesses, and he can come at it from you know, his own success story. Mm -hmm. Then we also bring in individuals who are maybe a year or two ahead of where companies mm -hmm. in our accelerator are. Someone like Christina York, who's the CEO of Spellbound, which is an augmented reality um, company here in town. Mm -hmm. Christina can share her recent experiences, her successes, her challenges, you know, even, even failures that she's had in a way that feels real and authentic to the companies in our cohort. Um, and you say it's a one-stop shop, but you know, as we talked about earlier, being a startup is incredibly risky. And just because you get three months or four months or ten months of mentorship, you know, we hope that that, in, that, that bends the failure curve. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it doesn't de-risk the business completely. And you know, there are things you may learn in the accelerator that cause you to pivot the business completely. There are things that you might uncover you had no idea were weaknesses in your business and where we hope it doesn't happen, but they might be fatal flaws that you didn't know. Um, so it's not as if you go through the accelerator and then it's smooth sailing. Sure, well, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't that, hope everybody would be in, in, enrolled. We'd all be in the accelerator, right? You have it with that, because that, I think that, you know, and this is just, there's a personality trait also that does come from entrepreneurs. They tend to be lone wolves. They like to do their own thing and not always are as interactive because it's, they believe in what they're doing and that, that takes a certain level of psychological positive nature. But do you, I mean, I'm you talked about Shark Tank and I, I'm interested, who is going to just, how do they, how is someone who going to find out about you? I mean, how, how do, how does someone, uh, that's why I'm trying to take a specific example that, well, I, I have this great idea, I want to start a company, and for most people, they might say, well, I'm just going to figure it out on my own. Where do, how do they, or how do you contact potential clients or customers that you feel would be worthy of the services you're offering? Uh, a number of different ways. So first of all, as I mentioned <coughs> before, we are heavily ingrained in the ecosystem. Okay. So we are constantly, um, talking to Ann Arbor Spark, to Michigan Venture Capital Association, to investors around town, but also those who provide services to startups. We have a great relationship with a number of the law firms in town who maybe have helped these businesses with their formation documents. Um, we also are members of the Global Accelerator Network, GAN, um, who do help us um, with deal flow across accelerators. And we, um, we are on AngelList, which is an online platform to connect startups with investors. Also, F6S, another similar um, platform. So there are a lot of avenues that we can do outreach. Um, and of course, you know, just being ingrained in the university. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, with the entrepreneurial organizations, even that are within the university, very few of us have the exact same audience. So for example, a company maybe that approaches the Office of Tech Transfer and isn't right for that group, Tech Transfer will then call us and say, hey, we think you should take a look at this company. I'm recruiting right now for our summer cohort, and that actually just happened this morning, where a colleague of mine at Tech Transfer said, I think, I think you should look at this organization. They fit your eligibility requirements. Um, can I make an introduction? And then, of course, um, our our own graduates, I will call them, make recommendations as well. Okay. So now, our let's take somebody who's come through the program. Can you give us an example of a success story? I mean, I'm sure there may be some that may. But what you started there now, you've been there for three years as mm -hmm. managing director, and so there should be some track record of, of success. Can you give us one example of someone who has gone through all your service? They've done the mentoring, they've done the analysis, they've had they've had other people in the industry look at it. And three years later, they're still here. Maybe that would be a better way of doing yes. it. Yes. So I will say we, we have a portfolio of 26 companies. 13 of them are still operational, which mm -hmm. is actually a really That's good incredible. percentage. Absolutely. Yep. Um, we have a company called Food Stand um, that went through our winter 2017 program. Founder Rachna Govani, just an incredible, an incredibly smart and engaging and just really thought so thoroughly and critically about what she was doing. And their application is 
a behavior change application to help individuals m make better health habits mm -hmm. through, I'm going to say, the, the psychological mechanisms that work for people. So tiny, tiny steps for big leaps. Mm -hmm. um, Rachna actually came to us from New York. She and her husband moved here. And she was new to the ecosystem, was introduced through the School of Public Health, actually, to us, um, and began fundraising for her organization. She uh, and her staff um, entertained an acquisition offer in 2019 and were acquired by Diet ID, which is another startup. Um, and she now is the COO of that company and um, remains pushing, pushing forward her products uh, through that organization. She also is now on our advisory board. <laughs> and she's been very pleased with your success and what the organization has done for her. Particularly if she was bought out, I'm sure she, that's a, a, a nice ending, or at least, at least a temporary thing. It is a nice ending. Um, well, I mean, there's so much more we can go on. I, well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I, I just, um, I'm going to have people come to your website to learn more about it because I, I just think as a service, the most important thing in our society is creating jobs for uh, to, and, and, and supporting entrepreneurship because it, it really is an important component. Two-thirds of all jobs in this country are created by smaller business, which is started by somebody, mm -hmm. and we need to be encouraging that in any industry, whether it be tech or something else. Well, and we, and just, uh, you mm -hmm. know, there is research that indicates um, we, for the first time, have unfortunately hit a point where more businesses are closing than opening. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is our responsibility to change that dynamic and make sure that we are fostering an environment, an ecosystem where it is certainly still risky, but it is possible for people to start these businesses and create jobs. Well, and apparently with the help of the Desai Accelerator, right? I That's the so. whole. Yes. Now, my final question is, you've had a rather interesting shift from from uh, financial planning. You've come to Ann Arbor. You are not moving back to Bridgeport, I don't think, at any time soon. Uh, we, my, I have settled here, okay, have roots so here. so you're going to become part of our community. But then where do you see yourself then? Or where would you either, do you, do you see yourself staying in this area do you, uh, in terms of the career path or some other where you want to move, or then the last question is where do you want to lead the Sci Accelerator? What would you like to see achieved in the next five years? Maybe so, that's better. I don't know if I want to pull you into another direction now no, or fine. if you want to go. But well, I have been here in the Ann Arbor area since I was 18 years old. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I've been here for 20 plus that's years. That's consistency. It is consistency. I, there are so many stories of people who come to the University of Michigan and then just don't end up leaving, right? Um, and so I, this community does have my heart. Um, you know, I met my husband here. I just had a baby a year ago, not quite a year ago. Um, so, so our family is here, um, and I, I don't feel like my my work is done here. I don't feel like my work at Desai is done. Um, we are exploring a number of opportunities to grow our own community, our Desai community. So, we have this cohort of 26 companies. A lot of them are still in town. A lot of them I still talk to on a daily, weekly, monthly basis about how they're doing. Um, and they talk to each other and they get to know each other. So teams from 2016 are interacting with teams from 2018. Um, we have one of our 2018 companies, Jotful, they opened their own co-working space. And so they're now bringing in startups to work with them. And so I. I am really interested in creating more opportunities for people who have been through our programming, post-accelerator programming. I'm interested in creating a work community where either full-time or part-time people can come to our organization and take up a chair, run their business out of there. I don't necessarily want to compete with the co-working spaces that are here, but I want to provide that opportunity for that cohort experience to remain for everybody who's gone through our program. Um, and we, of course, would, would love to see some students who have gone through our internship start businesses and come through our program. All right. Well, that sounds like a very ambitious and exciting Thank you. challenge for you over the next time. Uh, Andrew Kuyadov is the Managing Director of the Desai Accelerator at the University of Michigan. I want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much. We're going to give you the address now at the end of our show here to uh, contact to learn more about what they're doing. And also, I want to mention six months ago, we had talked about uh, getting a, a book together 
4A2 Insight. This is now available on Amazon of 13 interviews that we've done over the course of the year, everything from nonprofit to entrepreneurship to uh, national best-selling authors. So we're also we can give you where to look for that as well. So 4A2 Insight, until next time, I'm James Trost. <laughs>